I'll call to order the uh, Transportation Energy and Utility Committee on August 1st at 5.07. Um, I'll entertain a motion on our agenda. I would move that we adopt the agenda. My only uh, discussion point is I have not reviewed the minutes from last week, so I'd like to uh, postpone those until our next meeting in August. Okay. Given that amendment, um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Our agenda. Um, next is public forum. So before we get to get public forum, um, I just want to just a couple of things. I want everybody to be respectful in their comments. Um, and uh, and what's if, if you've already said something last week, unless you're here to say something different this week, it would be good in terms of the committee's ability um, to move the issue forward to just to hear you know new perspectives and, and testimony this week. Also, I would ask uh, you know we'll take as much time. There's not a lot of people signed up to speak. Are there a lot online? There are online. Anyone online can use the raise hand function. So we, you know, we, we have this room. Um, we have a hard stop at seven, and um, so we'd like to get to some deliberation as well. So just keep that in mind as as you're offering a public comment today. Um, try to keep it as brief as possible, but get your message across as well. And so with that, we'll uh, start. Um, and the first speaker tonight is, uh, is it Lucy Hillman? Yes. Okay. Please. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Lucy Hillman. I'm Executive Director of Facilities Management at UPM. And I'm uh, just expressing support to maintain having uh, renewable gas and also wood, advanced wood heating to this ordinance. As we try to evaluate many options going forward, we want to keep our options open uh, for the future so that uh, we are able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So it has that we keep that those items away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Ashley Adams. Hi, good evening. I want to thank you for your careful attention to the carbon fee ordinance and for convening additional um, time for public comment during this meeting. The predicament that this ordinance has created began with the extremely misleading ballot question two, which a number of people fought against, myself included. It passed because voters believed the carbon impact fee would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, its stated purpose was, quote, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the city. However, due to a widely misunderstood word, many of us are here again tonight attempting to stop the city from incentivizing greenhouse gas intensive and otherwise harmful sources of heat. That word is renewable. Governments and utilities everywhere use the word renewable because they know the public mistakes it for quote unquote climate friendly. They use it in an effort to promote combustion based heat and energy. Burlington Electric and Vermont Gas are just two examples. As every climate scientist will tell you, we need zero carbon heat and energy, not renewable. We know through physics and chemistry that all combustion-based sources of heat and energy, whether they're renewable for 40 years, 100 years, or 1,000, will continue to pump greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We also know that combustion-based sources come with a host of other harmful impacts, including to biodiversity. Please do not forget that if by some miracle we succeed in salvaging a habitable climate, we may still be taken down by, by mass extinction. Look no further than to the collapse of insect populations if you doubt that this is on the near horizon. You need not listen to me. There's ample scientific evidence available. No further study is needed. You need only to listen to the scientists. I implore you to first do no harm. Please do not incentivize the use of combustion-based heating systems in our city through this carbon impact bay. If you do so, you will be increasing the use of polluting and damaging heat sources. Furthermore, you'll be deceiving Burlington voters who passed ballot question two. They voted yes, not because they wanted to incentivize dirty sources of heat, but because they believed in the spirit of the proposed ordinance that it would result in a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in the city. If you pass this ordinance as written, you're doing nothing short of defying the intent of the Burlington voters who wanted, who want and deserve real action on climate and preservation of the living world. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Nick Persepieri. Thank you. At the last meeting, um, we heard from Mr. Springer, who was advocating for basically incorporating into the city's ordinance language from the State Affordable Heat Act, or S-5, and I submitted a, a write-up explaining why the city shouldn't do that. I just wanted to make sure that you received that, and I ask that you make that part of the record. You've done so. Thank you. So I won't repeat the points that are in that write-up. I agree with um, what Ms. Adams just said, that we should not be allowing or incentivizing combustion-based heating sources in the city. The, the ordinance as written would impose a fee on fossil fuel heating, which is primarily gas, but not on several types of so-called renewable energy, which actually emit more uh, greenhouse gases and have other environmental problems that I've documented in some of the submissions that I've made in writing. I won't repeat those either. In fact, I, as I said earlier, I support the city's push towards electrification and heat pumps. Remember this ordinance addresses new construction and we ought to be able to build new residential new construction so that it's weatherized sufficiently so that heat pumps can provide all needs. There's no need for these other polluting high greenhouse gas so-called renewable types of energy. And if for some reason that is not an option for someone, and the next best option is actually natural gas, which emits fewer greenhouse gases, has fewer air pollution problems than all of the other so-called renewables. With all due respect to UVM, advanced wood heating and renewable, renewable gas would both put more greenhouse gas emissions into the air and advanced wood heating has severe uh, local air pollution issues. Um, the American Lung Association recommends that people not use advanced wood heating to heat their homes, and commercial boilers also emit excess pollutants compared to fossil fuel fired systems. These have no place in a city, especially when we're trying to promote. Uh, dense, walkable development. Um, so we think that all of these so-called renewables should be prohibited. If you're going to impose a fee on them, um, Councillor Bergman had an interesting suggestion last meeting that I hadn't considered before, and that is that um, the voters have approved a fee on fossil fuel thermal energy systems. And so it might be, we might be able to construe that to include um, gas fired furnaces or oil fired boilers, regardless of what type of fuel they use, because there's still a system designed. Uh, to use fossil fuels, or they could also use an alternative system. The current ordinance wouldn't do that, but it might be changed to allow that. Uh, thank you for considering my views. Thank you, Nick. Um, next, is, next is Catherine Bach. Hello again. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, it's kind of different from what the others have said and from what I said last time, and it's not long, so I, I'd like to say it anyway. Um, I have no doubt that we all wanna do what's best to reduce emissions and do what's best to reduce the climate chaos we're now living in. But solutions are conflicted. On the one hand, there's a need to supply sufficient energy for heating. 
Now, on the other hand, we must reduce emissions and increase efficiency. I remember my father, who was a Holocaust survivor from Austria, walking through the house many times every evening and turning off all the lights he found unnecessary, saying, stop wasting electricity. It was like we were not allowed to have more than one little spot of light on whatever we have to be doing. My four siblings and I found this very annoying, and we turned the lights right back on as soon as he left the room, mumbling to each other, they are not owls, we need lights to see. He was trying to save money, not aware that wasting electricity could also lead to drastic changes in the Earth's climate. But his point would be useful today. We need to find ways to use less energy, reduce emissions, and still survive the cold and the heat. Do we want a heating ordinance that increases emissions? We must be honest in how we calculate the carbon impact of heating fuels. Last meeting, there was talk of the GREEP model. And using that is not correct because it was specifically designed for liquid biofuels used in transportation applications. It's not designed for solid biomass and should never be used for this purpose. Unfortunately, S5 allows the state to use the Greek model for applications it's not designed for. As I understand this ordinance, it would impose a carbon impact fee on fossil fuel heating systems, but not on greenhouse gas intensive and otherwise harmful combustion-based renewables. The ordinance was written after the Burlington voters passed ballot measure two. That ballot question was extremely confusing and did not define the word renewable and failed to mention that burning renewables can emit as much or more carbon as fossil fuels, leading citizens to believe that passing the ballot measure would reduce greenhouse emissions in the city which it actually, will it actually do that? As I've said before, incentivizing the burning of any fuels does not reduce greenhouse gas emissions enough to stop the climate emergency. And to quote my father again, we must stop wasting energy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Billy Campbell. Jim, you're on. You, you got it. You got it both ways. Uh, I'm Dylan Jampatisa. I'm the director of public affairs for PGS. That's Vermont Gas. Um, welcome the opportunity to have a conversation with you. I want to commend the committee, uh, the council, the community on showing up, having this conversation. Certainly. Uh, we recognize that pace of change in how we address greenhouse gas emissions uh, is rapidly accelerating in Vermont. We want to be a partner in it, so we show up in that spirit. Um, I just want to give you a quick flyby of what I see as the, the big issues uh, affecting this conversation. And to start, just to give you a little background, at VGS, um, our long-term objective is to provide net zero emissions energy to customers. So we think our goals are aligned with the city of Burlington's, and we've been rapidly evolving uh, the portfolio of products that we provide to Vermonters to try to do this. This includes reducing energy usage, so through things like whole home weatherization, comprehensive air sealing, uh, and working with businesses, and large commercial and industrial customers to seal up their buildings, keeping more of the warmth in them so they use less energy. It includes increasing access to the latest technology and equipment available. So for us, you know, we were gas utility that service gas equipment up until a few years ago. Well, we're doing heat pump water heaters now. That's an electric appliance. We're doing heat pumps in customers' homes with things such as centrally ducted heat pumps. And we're working to bring to scale things such as geothermal energy development, something that we hope will decarbonize large customers. The third piece that we got to do is displace fossil fuels with low or no carbon alternatives. Um, that is part of what you're contemplating in this policy with regard to the types of fuels that would be allowed in the city in new construction. Um, I just want to pull back for a moment, though, and let you know that when we are looking to align our policy with what's going on at the state level, we're a fully regulated utility. We look toward the Global Warming Solutions Act. That's the 2020 law that the Vermont General Assembly enacted. That sets requirements for the amount of greenhouse gas reductions that need to take place in this state, most notably a 40% reduction by 2030 and a 80% reduction by 2050. Um, and then recently, 
we had uh, the Climate Council step forward to put forward the first ever climate action plan. That is the statewide blueprint of how we're going to reduce emissions. And they look at modeling through their subcommittees that considers a range of technologies in how we reduce emissions. Amongst those are many of the fuel types described in the ordinance. So with that, I also want to reference a new law that was just enacted, the Affordable Heat Act. A couple of folks have referred to it, also called the Clean Heat Standard, sometimes called S5. Now it's the law of the land, it's Act 18. The Affordable Heat Act is really important because it's a performance standard to transition the thermal sector. When we say thermal, it's buildings. This would transition the fuels and the equipment that are used to warm Vermonters' homes. It's a market-based program, so it would require Vermont Gas and other obligated parties, these are fuel dealers, kerosene dealers, oil and so forth, to uh, clean up the fuels that they deliver or to purchase credits for activities that incentivize cleaner energy alternatives. Perhaps it's an electric heat pump, it might be any number of things because they're defined in the bill. This would generate incentives for Vermonters to help transition to cleaner energy types. And it prioritizes low and moderate income Vermonters. About a third of those measures need to go to those folks. This would constitute the most robust low carbon fuel standard in the country. We work all the time on these policies. We know what's out there. This is hands down the most environmentally friendly low carbon fuel standard policy that's been described. I have the law right here. I've got multiple tabs. I'm not gonna take your time. You've got a lot to do. But I can walk you through the various ways that there's a carbon intensity thresholds, there are fuel pathways analysis, inclusive of biogenic emissions, upstream emissions. This is a robust piece of climate policy that looks at the total picture of reducing emissions. It also does something that's very important for us that I want to share with you tonight as you weigh this proposal. The statewide process that this will engage creates an apples to apples process. It's comparing technologies not based on their names, but on the science of what they will do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and provide Vermonters with a cleaner energy source in their home. So on that, the draft ordinance pretty closely aligns with Act 18 to the extent that it names the technologies, it provides a performance standard that folks need to measure to, um, and it doesn't penalize sources that would reduce emissions. On this front, um, I'll just say that I would urge you to consider how local regulations uh, will impact the statewide implementation of the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, I referenced Act 18, the Affordable Heat Act. That is looking at upstream emissions. It's considering how everything we do in Vermont to warm homes, to electrify different sectors, to create better solutions, how that impacts our environment. It's a very robust law. It's going to be taking place uh, in a regulatory process. The Public Utility Commission, members of the public can participate in those hearings. Uh, this is going to be a process that really focuses on the total picture. So as you design policy here, it's important to consider how it fits in. So with regard to that, just one final piece, the Global Warming Solutions Act, it's really unclear how it will impact customer costs. What we do think is that in the near term, there will be some upward cost pressure as a clean heat market is established. And you know, as a distribution utility, we're also an energy efficiency utility, we're also a service provider working in customers' homes. We think that we are well positioned to work with our customers and our communities, such as Burlington, to facilitate a transition that's affordable. At the same time, the new law, Act 18, is going to provide clear guidance on how thermal sector transformation should take place. This is just really important because we want to ensure that all the communities we work with, the policy is aligned with what is emerging there. And I'd be happy to meet with anyone to describe what's in the law, to let you know why we think it's going to provide the best set of baseline data for these community conversations that are going on around the state. So for now, I'll just leave with you with this, that the ordinance is introduced, the current draft provides flexibility. That's going to be really important for the state as it tries to make progress towards its climate goals. It's going to be important for those of us who are working to try to work with customers to transition to cleaner energy types and having certainty as to what it's going to include the certainty both to the customers who need flexibility in the energy choices they make and to the energy providers in the community is really important. We think all this will serve to benefit uh, our shared climate goals, the goals of the state, the goals the city has set out, and the ways that we can work together to achieve them. So I'll leave you with that. Got the law here. Happy to talk about it, but I'm not going to do it now. So please reach out if I can answer any questions. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, Don. Appreciate it. Um, I saw Jack Hansen, too, in person. Do you want to speak? Uh -huh. That'd be great, yeah.
Great. Good to see everyone. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, I would say, so I sent you all some proposed amendments and my thinking behind them. In terms of my comment, I would say we shouldn't confuse this particular ordinance with the bigger picture and the bigger mission. The bigger mission is that we have to decarbonize every building in the city um, as quickly as possible. That, that's what we're trying to do. Um, this ordinance is trying to get the ball rolling on that and specifically targeting new situations where there's a new system being installed, which is a long-term investment that's being made. So whether that's a new building or an existing large building that's replacing their system, that's a, that's a long-term investment and that's a moment that we're trying to intervene and where it's the most logical and the most important to invest in the right technology, the technology that we most want to see. And I think we have pretty widespread agreement in city government, from my understanding that electrification is the preferred method and the preferred way to go. I think for this policy, that really needs to be the focus, electrification and geothermal where possible, um, which is also a system that's you know running on electricity, but um, using the using the temperature of the ground below. Um, I think those are the lowest impact systems. Those are the ones we should invest in. We're gonna have to decarbonize the entire building sector. There's gonna be a lot of buildings that are going to take different approaches. And I don't think the city is going to be able to force everyone to rapidly make the switches we want. But this is an area where I feel like we can come in with strong policy and actually dictate what we think is best because these are players that have the financing to create um, these new systems and, and do it right from the beginning when making these long-term investments. So I think these are moments where we gotta do it right and go electric. Vermont Gas is already servicing so many buildings, including so many individual homes, that they're gonna need to supply with renewable fuels. And they haven't made that much progress so far in terms of converting their fuel mix to be renewable, but ultimately they're gonna have to change the mix for a lot of buildings. But in terms of new systems, let's not add to that problem. Let's do the, those right so that it's a smaller pie that Vermont Gas is gonna to have to decarbonize. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. So that's everybody in person. There's nobody else who hasn't spoken to this too now. Um, so who do we have online? Pike Porter should be able to unmute. All right, Pike. Good evening. Um, I'd like to respond to some comments that uh, Mr. Springer made uh, last week regarding um, a difference of opinion, he he said, between um, how we count uh, carbon emissions from um, woody biomass and uh, renewable natural gas and, and other plant-based fuels. Um, the city shouldn't be making policy decisions based on opinions. They should be making them on facts. And I and others for months and months have been trying to point you towards the facts. And the facts are that plant-based fuels are as dirty or dirtier than fossil fuels. Mr. Springer is providing you a lot of assumptions, namely the assumption that woody biomass and other biofuels are carbon neutral. That is not based on facts and we should not be making policy decisions based on assumptions or opinions. The uh, Affordable Heat Act, S-5, is a 48-page document, I believe, um, as of last count, and it has several uh, guardrails, none of which are incorporated into this heating ordinance that before you. So there's a drawdown for such things as renewable natural gas in the Affordable Heat Act. There is no drawdown in this ordinance. So you're taking much of what the state perceives as good, uh, but throwing out any guardrails for it. Um, and you need to place, if you're gonna include combustion-based sources, you need to place clear guardrails, um, life cycle analyses, um, carbon uh, intensity values, um, 
And I don't think the city's equipped to do that. Um, can any of you explain uh, what a renewable sourced uh, biofuel is? It's right in there, a sustainably sourced biofuel. Can you, any of you define what that is? Do any of you know how much carbon is reduced by an, uh, an, an advanced wood heating system? That's an easy one, because I told you, none. It produces no less carbon dioxide than any other wood heating system. Um, there's a lot that you're taking or, or grabbing from S5 without really in including any of the guardrails. And now I'm repeating myself, so I will sign off. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Next is Peter Duvall. Go ahead, Peter. Well, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Strike all is a time-honored tradition in legislation. It's used when the original draft has problems that can't be resolved by editing. That's what's in order for this ordinance. The future of the McNeil Generating Station and the proposed thermal energy ordinance are intricately linked. They're linked to several bits of legislation, not just S5. BED has been central and transparent in creating complicated overlapping thermal credit schemes at both the local and state level. The misadventure has taken many years. The awkward wordiness of the draft ordinance indicates the weak logic underlying both the ordinance and the steam pipe project and the associated legislation. The ordinance is fatally flawed. An interesting key feature of the ordinance is bringing all carbon emissions from equipment operations up front to assess the fee. It essentially makes the ordinance a ban on new fossil fuel heating equipment in new construction. But it also reinforces the burning of biomass and locking in dependence on McNeil. If the objective is to reduce and eliminate greenhouse gas emissions, this proposed ordinance would fail to achieve the objective. The ulterior, pur ulterior purpose of propping up McNeil is an obvious, consider the a test. Ask yourself, if you wanna pass an ordinance that simply zeroes out greenhouse gas emissions in new buildings, what would it be? It wouldn't be this awkward credit scheme. The answer is a simple change in the building code. All new construction shall be commissioned FIAS zero certified. A one sentence ordinance. FIAS, of course, is a passive house institute in the US. And there are tougher standards than FIAS zero, including the living building challenge, but it's a good start and ensures that new buildings would be truly low carbon and zero combustion. And Burlington wouldn't be breaking much new ground. Denver, Boulder County, Massachusetts, New York, and Washington, Washington State all use FIAS certification in their building codes. You have a chance to do something that is rare for lawmakers, passing an effective ordinance while simplifying the code. Make the ordinance one sentence and delete the whole bunch of nonsense that BED has been pushing. Make all new construction FIAS zero compliant. Buildings live much, much longer than humans. Your great grandchildren will thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Next is Peter Sterling. Peter Sterling, go ahead. Great. Hello, and thank you for your time this evening. My name is Peter Sterling, and I'm the Executive Director of Renewable Energy Vermont, the trade association representing the hundreds of businesses working to move Vermont to a 100% renewable energy future. With just over one third of Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions coming from heating and cooling our buildings, reducing thermal emissions is critical in Vermont's fight against global warming. That is why REV supports the enactment of Burlington's carbon pollution impact fee as approved by vo Burlington voters this past town meeting day to encourage the design of large commercial buildings to use heat from renewable electricity or wood pellets instead of fossil fuels like oil or natural gas. 
I encourage the city council to follow the wishes of voters and keep the carbon pricing at the maximum level of $150 a ton and to ensure buildings are able to employ, deploy truly renewable fuels and technologies, including advanced wood heat. Implementing this forward-looking policy will once again reinforce Burlington's leadership role in decarbonizing our society and show the rest of the nation how carbon pricing can be part of a policy solution to fight climate change in the real world context. Again, thank you for your time and consideration of this important issue. Thank you, Peter. Cheryl Joy Lipton. Cheryl Joy Lipton. Oh, Cheryl Joy Lipton. Yeah, hi, thanks. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I've heard a few things. Uh, I've heard a bunch of things that I would like to talk, uh, agree with, and then um, a couple of things that are that you should be aware of. Using S5 or the Affordable Heating Act um, is really, you, you need to be aware of that because right now it's not actually passed as a rule. It's um, just, as they say, a study at this point. And in, it's not passed legislation until probably 2025 when it will have to go through the PUC and then they'll come back and then it will have to pass legislature. So it's not really feasible to use that as a as a an argument. Um, the other thing I would like to bring up is that we really can't be um, net zero right now. We can't be renewable right now. We really actually should be uh, negative on the carbon because what status quo is obviously not working. So we can't just keep status quo. Um, and the the issue of renewability with um, biomass and biofuels is that they aren't really renewable in the time frame that we need them to be. If we are going to be using something that's going to take 80 years, 40 years, even 20 years to replenish. That's not, um, we need it to be a lot quicker than that right now. That could have been something to talk about maybe, you know, some decades ago, but it's not right now. Um, the other thing is that using, so first of all, uh, I should have started with this, which is that if you're going to have a fee on some things, whatever doesn't have a fee is, of course, encouraged. So, of course, you're going to be encouraging any of the um, renewable natural gas and biomass and advanced wood heating, et cetera. Not only is that bad for the environment and bad for the climate, it's also bad for human health. So advanced wood heating has been, um, is the data and science is there showing that it's unhealthy for people to for people and also the environment bringing up the flooding and everything that we have been um dealing with uh here in vermont when we encourage the use of woody biomass then it's going to increase its use if that's even at the state that we're using it now it's too hard on the forest ecosystems and you know if you're just having cropland and it be and raising trees as crop, then that's one thing. It is not ecosystems and um, good for the hydrological system that was working so wonderfully before we messed around with it. Um, so to continue and to increase the amount of wood used is going to cause more damage to the forests and create more um, flooding and runoff than even exists now. Um, what we have to think about at this point, what we all have to think about is what is going to be uh, fixing the problem, not uh, and using any kind of um, renewable natural gas and especially and biomass woody biomass is not going to fix the the problem it's more damaging to both the climate and to habitat and to forest ecosystems and we need more there's less than 1% of older forests out there right now 
And we need much more than that in order to make the land soak that extra rain up instead of having it be run up, run off and causing continuing to cause catastrophic flooding like we've had. I'm happy to talk more about this. It's a really complex, it's a, it's not complicated, but it's, it's more in, it's a subject that could use more comment. Um, so I'm happy to talk more about that if you'd like to hear about it. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Is, right. Is there anybody else online who wants to speak at public comment? Please raise your hand now. Okay, then we will go ahead and close public comment. Um, and then we will move back to uh, the ordinance discussion that we were having at our last meeting. We have the ED here. We'd like to join us. Hi. Hi. Um, so the purpose of tonight was to take some of the testimony that we hadn't had um, last week. We weren't able to get to because of uh, the length of our agenda. And so we've done that. Um, and one of the things I would like to do in the committee um, after allowing BD to respond and to maybe add additional comments is to talk about uh, process going forward into. So I guess first, I, so that's sort of my, my vision of how the rest of this night goes. Is there anybody who has- I have amendments to the ordinance and I'd let you know that most of which were shared with, other, with you and Hannah. Uh, from Jack, but uh, several of them were not um, as I marched through the uh, the ordinance. So I that works in terms of process. I can see how that would fit in a process discussion. Okay. My my intention is to uh, to to march through the ordinance or at least through amendments starting at the top. And, I, I just started reading the stuff that Jack sent over today, so I don't know that I'm I'm willing to discuss this, but I think um, my my inclination to make this part of the meeting record, and if we need to continue um, making recommendations, we would do so. But I'm certainly open to discuss. I I, I understand that. I, I would like them to be placed. You know, for the for deliberation, I, I'm okay with people chatting and taking a uh, taking another meeting. I mean, I think that the um, uh, it, the it is reasonable, and again, this gets into process. So I'm willing to wait because okay. Darren is sitting there to to to, to chat on that. Um, you want to do that? Let's, let's do that, and then we'll we'll get Hannah's uh, take on process after Darren. Darren. I'll, I'll try to be succinct um, since we talked a lot last meeting. Um, I guess the first uh, item I would just mention is um, I do think that the uh, initiative here is, is really good policy and we're very supportive of it as it currently stands. Um, we appreciate the alignment with the state clean heat standard. Um, we understand that we can't recreate that regulatory framework from scratch here in Burlington. We want to be where we can be aligned. Um, I disagree with comments that state that renewable fuels are necessarily uh, larger in terms of carbon emissions. I don't think that is consistent with uh, the science, certainly not in all cases. I think it's conceivable in certain cases, uh, but I think there are a lot of instances where renewable fuels have demonstrated uh, greenhouse gas emissions benefits, and that's why we're supportive of them. Uh, it so happens that renewable tends to align, not perfectly, but largely, with greenhouse gas emissions reduction. It so happens that fossil fuels that are geologically stored underground, brought up and burned, happen to align very poorly with uh, the climate and with greenhouse gas emissions. So um, I, I won't go into the weeds on that. I'm happy to discuss it further. Um, but the, um, the kind of the bottom line for us is uh, the idea here that was put before Burlington voters that they approved, and we're grateful for that, is to put a fee on fossil fuels because they are a driver of the climate crisis um, and to align where we can here with renewable fuels, whether that's electrification, which we're strongly supportive of, 
um, for other renewable fuels that may have applications. The only other point I'd like to make is that this ordinance applies not only to new construction, but to large existing buildings and to city buildings. And the large existing buildings uh, may get short shrift in the conversation, but it's a really critical point. I appreciate that UBM is here. Uh, there are other buildings uh, that were represented in stakeholder discussions to try to figure out what is practical, technologically feasible, cost effective within a reasonable parameter uh, for an existing building that's going to be replacing a system, a boiler, a water heating system. Um, you know, how can we add a carbon price to that calculation so that they can make a good decision? Uh, as, as Jack Hansen mentioned, when they're making that investment, uh, but do so in a way that gives them uh, as many tools in the toolbox as possible. So I just want to reference that this applies not only to new construction, which it does, uh, but also to major investments in large existing buildings, of which we believe there are roughly 80 uh, that would qualify in the city of Burlington, in addition to city buildings, and a number of which are uh, part of, of UVM, UVM Medical Center, Champlain, the school district, and then several uh, more that are in, uh, you know, private sector or nonprofit uh, entities. So um, I'll stop there. I'm glad to answer questions or help uh, answer questions if you have, uh, but I don't want to take more time. Okay. Um, do, do it. Does anybody from the committee have questions for Jim Springer? No. Hannah, um, do you have uh, comments or? ideas about like what you'd like to see in the process? Um, like you, I'm just now seeing the amendments that Jack sent over. So I like need a minute to read through them before I would be ready to comment on any of them. Um, I'd be really interested in putting them out there, whether we take the time to go through them, to, to read them now is, uh, you know, think about them and, and talk about them now, that's fine. Um, having a short conversation, I'd be happy to give my, my reasoning. Uh, we've gotten sure. some reasoning but from Jack, but that may not be, uh, it, it's not in the public domain, so we should, we should share that in the public domain. Um, and then willing to, to see, uh, I mean, I would like, us to act expeditiously on that uh, and to the extent to which I disagree with my friend Peter Duvall about strike all and just have a very simple thing. Um, I, I think that the framework that we got um, with amendments is one that I am in support of. Um, so that necessitates our going through them. Um, so that is that's, that's my desire for tonight. Okay. One thing I was going to ask, uh, Jack, since you sent that material over in an email, are you okay with us adding that to the meeting record? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So uh, we share that email, and you can add that to the meeting record. And anybody else who spoke at public comment, I know Nick had sent some things over. Um, who wants to introduce anything to the meeting record? Uh, if you have your comments in electronic form. Send them to the committee and we'll make sure that they're added like we've been doing in the previous weeks. And so Nix was, I mean, Nix was, was, said that yes. Nix was um, included. Uh, um, well, with that, I guess we can um, go ahead. I, I guess I, I would just like to make sort of a general comment sure. and then we can sure. go into the amendments um, that you want to propose. And so, like, as we've been going through this process, I really have been trying to take it all in and following the, um, the sort of uh, ideas that people have been putting forward. And as a matter of fact, uh, tonight, uh, Peter Duvall spoke, he mentioned um, in, in place of his strike all, he mentioned a, uh, something I hadn't heard before, this bio certified. So that's something I wanna, I wanna look at now. And I've been sort of doing that and chasing things down um, as they've come up in, some of the testimony we've heard. Um, one thing that has become sort of increasingly clear, it was it should have been obvious from the start, is like, and people have mentioned it in public comment, is that we have authority to, um, to do this for fossil fuels, not for any of the renewables that are even mentioned in the ordinance, at least not with the current charter language as it was passed by the voters. So. I, Okay, well, you're done. I'll, yeah, I'll yeah, absolutely. That a little bit. Okay. Um, 
And so I, th I think we need to be mindful of that. I'm not saying future charter action might not be more expansive, but right now that's sort of what we have. So when I look at some of the discussion we're having, I'm not sure that even if we include it in the ordinance, we really have the authority to, to regulate. Like the, um, the one that stands out is potentially of the listed fuels there that we may have some discretion on um, would be the renewable gas um, because it, it, my understanding would be blended with fossil fuel based gas. However, I still fall back to sort of in a general sort of framework, I would like to be aligned with um, what the state's doing just because not being aligned with what the state does, I think, and I've said this about a number of topics, not just this one, Burlington sort of goes it alone. Um, you know, we may think that we're leading, but we can also at the same time have a side effect of making Burlington less competitive um, or less affordable in terms of a place to live or to attract capital or uh, the kinds of things we'd like to see happen in our city. So that's sort of like the lens that I bring I bring when I consider these things. So those are my sort of general comments about this. And I'm also at a point where Jack had sent this stuff over this morning and I thanked him for it, but I was in meetings all day. So I haven't had a chance to really digest it and think about that. Um, I read the, the material that Nick sent over on Saturday or Sunday when he sent that over, but I'm still sort of, sort of like, you know, I'm trying to understand and take it all in. So that's sort of my general, my general comment. I don't know, and you had anything else before, um, to, for, for Councilor Bergman gets down on amendments? Um, I would just, I would probably echo what you said for the most part. I think when we approach this, making sure that we're aligned with the state is incredibly important just because those folks have been doing the work for so long. And I think that it will put us in a better position if we can model our ordinance after them. Um, but again, I also did not, I'm just looking at my city email now. So I, this is the first time that I'm reading the amendments. And so I am just not um, probably prepared to make a ton of comments on them tonight. So I, I have the, the pleasure of um, having survived to being 70 years old. That means that I have gotten to retire. And therefore, I have a lot more time than you two. This is not your full-time job. I totally appreciate that. So I, let me just start I with want to that. challenge that last statement, by the way. Which, Which I have what's a full-time job. <laughs> another discussion. Well, <laughs> the, it, it, the demands of this, we could get sidetracked, and I am easily sidetracked, so I will not. Um, to, Liz, you, you mentioned a couple of things, or maybe there are three things that I'm the chat, but I've forgotten the third. The, the first has to do with uh, the charter, has to do with charter authority. Um, section uh, 48 of the Burlington Charter in subsection 66, which we adopted with a charter change a couple of elections ago, says that we have the authority to regulate thermal energy systems in residential and commercial buildings, including, and I will just add parenthetically, but not limited to, including assessing carbon impact or alternative compliance payments for the purpose of reducing greenhouse gas emissions throughout the city. No assessment of a payment, I'm now going to edit a little bit, shall be imposed unless previously authorized by a majority of the voters, blah, blah. So there are two aspects of our authority as a city. One is that we can regulate these systems in residential and commercial. And two is that we can charge a fee. But the fee is where the limit to fossil fuels is in place. Uh, it, no, actually, I'm sorry, that's not correct. It, 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 the, the fee has to be approved by the voters. So we can, we can actually tax if the voters have authorized us. I say tax, I should say the fee. Um, the uh, non-fossil fuels. So we've got that authority, but for purposes of 
Today, we've got to then look to the, um, oh, come on, Jeannie, you just, you had it. Oh, wait a minute, I got it here. We have to look at what the voters approved. And the voters approved the, in, insta, the imposition of a fee um, for new construction buildings that install fossil fuel thermal energy systems instead of using renewable energy systems or renewable fuels. Okay. So that's what the fee is limited to. But this is not simply a fee ordinance. And we've talked about that before. And one of my amendments will, it's a very small amendment, but will make sure, will is intended to give us the money from the fees that we're collecting to be able to administer it. Because if you, the surest way, says Grover Nyquist, to kill a government is to shrink the amount of money you can have so that you can choke it in a bathtub. And I'll be damned if I'm going to be part of any system like what Grover Nyquist has proposed. So we've got to put in the authority to actually really have the funds to administer this. So um, the fee is one thing, the regulations are the other. And you had one other, you had one other point in terms of, uh, maybe those were just the, the two points. Just, a, and I misspoke, I didn't, I meant uh, not the charter uh, change which happened the year prior, right. but the ordinance, enabling ordinance language that happened. For the fee, right. for, for, for the fee. Yeah. So, um, so that is the, 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 the sort of the framework that we've got here. Um, going back to the ordinance, oh, the, the last generalized point, and it, it segues into um, the, the actual amendments. I too want to be aligned with state law, but S18, I think it is. S5. S5 is Act 18. Thank you. I know this is the legislature's wonder like that. Um, of which I, you know, can call up. Is in the preliminary stages of its implementation. And in fact, the key things that we have to, that we've incorporated in here actually will not even come into draft form until about a year and a quarter, until next fall. Don't know. And they gonna and in a year and a half in January of 25, the legislature is gonna vote on them. And indeed, you listen to the governor, and they overrode they overrode the governor. But um, the governor is going to have a say in this as well. So I I think actually that we can align with the the at least the spirit of the state legislation, but we should not actually get ahead of that. And that whole carbon credit, which I want to thank you, Dylan. That was really helpful. I, 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 Dylan offered me the opportunity to chat, and we did, and it was really helpful for me to understand that. And I, I, I totally appreciate the, uh, the time that you spent to do that. And it is quite possible that many of the things that we have listed will end up, if getting into our ordinance, at least if I, you know, if, if the way that I'm looking at it uh, uh, is approved. But just as a segue, I, I believe that the heart and soul of this ordinance is in um, section, in the definition section in 8-77, in the definitions of renewable fuel, which reduces greenhouse gas emissions. And I think that that heart and soul gets too far ahead of what the state system is, uh, is going to do, what that regulatory process is. And I don't want to go there. I think it opens the door for things that, and it, we do have actually ways to get back 
but you know, uh, I speak in metaphors, so it's like opening the barn door, but the critters out. I, I don't want to do that. I, I know the habit that goats have when they get out of the pen and they eat up all of your orchard trees. So I, I've seen that happen. I don't want that to happen. So I can begin uh, by um, going through on the, the, the lines where I see there are some changes that I would like to, to have made, if you would. Sure. And let me just say that I'm not proposing a change here, but on line um, 13 and 14, lines 13 and 14, we actually reference in this ordinance a particular vote on a particular date. And I'm not sure that we should be doing that. I didn't move to change that. I understand why it's here. Uh, if this gets amended and there are changes by the voters, you've got to amend that section. I, I mean, I don't know that that's the best drafting, but I, I just sort of like sort of throw it out. That's sort of the picky person that I am when coming to, to draft ordinances, which I've done far too many. Um, so the first um change that i would uh make would, that i propose to make is on a line 35 and fundamentally what it does and this is what this here and so and so here it's is different than jack no well there are a couple of things that are different and but that's a very clean that's a that's a clean one for maddie yes you're welcome and here's a hard copy for you. And I have a hard copy for you, Anna, but you're not here. So I'm sorry. So I'll take this out for me to take a picture of this. Thank you, Anna. So the first one on, th on line 35, it actually, it says here uh, to delete the line and replace it with, it says thermal energy from exclusively renewable comma non-fossil fuel sources such as, in fact, we have the words thermal energy or from there. So it's really just adding in front of the, uh, the colon there and then you're gonna have the list. So that would be the first one. And maybe it makes sense for me just to go through um, them sequentially or if you know if you want to do that then we then can we can, then we can go and then we can go back okay. or go just any way you want to do. Um, and um, I, I wanna sort of echo the, what, what Jack said, and this will be put into the record. Um, and I hope all the, the, the public comments, uh, particularly the ones that were in writing, will also get um, into the, uh, the public record. But as I just said, the ballot item gives us authority to put a fee on um, fossil fuels. It doesn't give us authority to put a fee on renewables. Um, we can't redefine fossil fuels nor renewables as, as we can't redefine fossil fuels as renewables nor renewables as fossil fuels, but we can provide examples of widely accepted renewable thermal energy options that achieve compliance with the ordinance. So this is Jack's reasoning on that. And so now we would march down to um, the next. So there's no changes in number one, which is the electric power thermal equipment. There is no change in number two, the solar water heating, um, and there's no change in the renewable energy-based district heating. Then the, the, the proposal is to delete lines 52 through 65. These are the three, one, two, three, four, four, other types of fuel, the green hydrogen source, the advanced wood heating, the sustainably sourced biodiesel or the renew and renewable gas. Um, and 
the reasoning, I think, is included with what, what Jack was saying, but also this is where the, the state law needs to get enacted and they, they need to develop, they need to develop the, uh, the credits. And without that, we've got um, a major problem. There is a whole section, section 8127, tradable clean heat credits, it is many pages long. Um, it's got credit values and credit, uh, a list of, uh, of eligible measures. Um, it's got uh, and it's got to have, there's going to be an analysis of carbon intensity of fuels. Um, it goes on. There are emissions schedule. So this is a complicated thing that the legislature is going to create. Uh, we're, I don't think that we're ready to determine that uh, these things are ready, uh, are, are, are good enough for us, and then wait for the legislature to say, oh, by the way, they're not necessarily, or this is what the situation is. I think that we have the time in my conversations, both in the committee last, uh, last meeting, and also um, with other folks, it does not seem to me that these are um, our systems that we are going to be um, needing to, um, to to be permitting right now, at least before the, the the system is in place in the state. But I would just say that in the deletion of this, I would then go, I am not proposing to delete 67 through 70, which is sort of a catch-all. It, it, it is a loophole. I, 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 I understand that this will be a loophole, but what it does do is it provides a, an owner, it, provi it provides an owner with an, an opportunity to say, we can document that um, the system that we're going to propose, and it sounds maybe like the advanced wood heating system may be a one that is, um, is prime for this, that is going to effectively meet, you know, state standards. And so that, that is why I left that in because, you know, there are, there are possibilities and you need to have a system for that. I would know that we have got a typo that we need to correct in line 68, regardless of anybody's thinking about my um, my, uh, my my proposed amendments, we have a typo that we should correct uh, for the word receives. So we have an extra E in there, but that's an easy thing to, to do. I just wanted to point that out. Moving along, um, to, uh, to line 73, this is also a very technical uh, amendment. We say at the end of the, the, the line of this section, uh, and this section is refers to, well, says what it means. It's the section, it's section 8-77, which is the definition section. What line is that? 73. Eligible to satisfy the requirements yeah. of this section, yeah. and I, we just need to change that to section um, to delete the, the this and change it to eight seventy eight for fuels that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. If such, it just carries on. But ultimately, where the requirements are are in the next section down. It's not in the definitions, um, and um, I if. I am just not understanding that. I'd be, of course, happy to um, understand it, uh, understand where I'm wrong. I I think that these that this and the typo these are easy mistakes that drafting made. And I I, I want to thank Darren actually for writing a really I think it's really a good ordinance and it's a complicated ordinance and trying to link it with the uh, with the state. So um, you know. There, this is something 
I think is a mistake. I might be wrong, like I, I said, because you know, and if if so, you know, and but it's not a criticism that I make in in in, in doing that. I want to just acknowledge the good work that uh, that you did on that. Um, in lines um, one forty six through one fifty four. And you know, I actually you know, this is this is not your copy. So Darren, here, let, let me give you a copy here. So that make it easier for, for you. I had only okay. thank you. Three. I'm sorry for all the rest of you guys. I didn't make it to uh, you know. Um to delete lines 146 through 154. This is in section and subsection D of section 8-78, which is the um although the other I said was the heart and soul. This is the way that it that, that heart and soul works within the body. This is the body that, that heart and soul get placed into. And it is replaced with um I'll just read it. There's a there's a pretty significant deletion. Um, fuel or renewable fuel that reduces greenhouse gas emissions. An, an applicant shall demonstrate compliance by providing a contract that shows a that a renewable that the renewable fuel that reduces greenhouse gas emissions is being delivered directly to that building's thermal energy for the energy system. And I have added to what Jack had said for the life of that thermal energy system and B, the estimated quality quantity of renewable fuel that reduces greenhouse gas expected to be delivered to that building's thermal energy system. This changes a much more complicated um, approach and um, what Jack has indicated, and I, I agree, um, is our goal as a city laid out in the net zero energy roadmap and elsewhere is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and fossil fuel use right here in Burlington, not pay for reductions elsewhere. A building that is consuming fossil fuels here but paying a fee to a fossil fuel company in hopes that they will reduce fossil fuel use elsewhere is a system that is much harder for the city to regulate than simply requiring actual physical reductions of, of fossil fuel use at the building here in Burlington. Furthermore, the health and safety benefits for Burlington residents are only achieved through physical changes here, not through payments to support changes elsewhere. Um, this uh, deletion relates to what it would it let me just read what is being deleted. Um, it, they go uh, fuel that reduces greenhouse gas emissions, such as gas utility services that could utilize fossil fuel or renewable gas or oil heat systems that could utilize oil or biodiesel. An applicant shall demonstrate compliance either via a contract demonstrating that the fuel required by the thermal energy system is fully sourced from such other renewable fuels or technologies for the life of that thermal energy system. Parenthetically, I just brought that for the life of the energy system into that. I think that we inadvertently were dropping that in Jack's initial. Um, or two little I, um, annual compliance certification that the applicant is pursuing is purchasing renewable fuel to cover the entire need of the thermal energy system. If the applicant uses the annual compliance certification and the applicant fails to provide an annual compliance certification in any year that the applicant is using renewable fuel that reduces greenhouse gas emissions, the applicant will be assessed an alternative compliance carbon pollution impact fee equal to a pro rata share of the remaining expected life of the thermal energy system. And I just have to say that I'm, I'm intrigued by the certification process and with the, uh, the thinking that is really behind that because as things change as maybe the, they, they, maybe a person wouldn't um, certify, you know, how do you approach that? Uh, but 
one of the problems that I think we need to uh, make sure that we're not creating is too um, burdensome an administrative system and compliance system, as I said last uh, meeting, will require, it's not just set it and forget it, right? Or, you know, done and, you know, you're done. You, you get a building permit, you follow all the requirements, you, um, uh, you install it, the, the inspector comes, they say, this is great, and, and they go. And there's no annual uh, process in the way that our building system works. Certification systems um, require that. And we sort of have that in the building, in, in the uh, rental housing system. Uh, we wouldn't continue to have that if you go way up. We did change the, uh, the right to like say, well, guess what? The uh, Department of uh, Public Utility, the Public Utility Commission uh, has found that this fuel isn't any good. So you've got to have a, um, a system that is administrative in regard to this. But I think a certification system is actually not um, the, uh, uh, I, I haven't decided that that is the right thing to do with that. Um, the, uh, there's a proposal to uh, delete lines 156 through 160, which says if an applicant with one or more buildings is seeking a permit pursuant to this chapter and is already using one or more thermal energy systems that, that rely on a renewable fuel that reduces greenhouse gas emissions, the applicant may apply for credit toward any alternative compliance carbon pollution impact fee equal to the carbon value of the renewable fuel, which reduces greenhouse gas emissions used for any thermal energy system since January 1st, uh, 2023. And what um, Jack uh, Jack's reasoning, which I think also makes much sense is these lines undermine the intended impact of this ordinance, which is to reduce fossil fuel use and greenhouse gas emissions in buildings. Building owners who have already taken steps to reduce fossil fuels use, well, use uh, fossil fuels use and greenhouse gas emissions will be, reap the benefits of doing so. They do not need to be permitted to increase per pollution going forward to allow them to do so undermines the intent of the policy while providing no tangible benefits to our community or climate. On the rebate side, we give incentives to people who quote unquote switch from fossil fuels to electric heating, not those who have quote unquote already have electric heating. Let's use the same logic on the regulatory side. Um, two more amendments. On line 163, uh, which is where the proceeds of the, uh, the, the fee would go to. Um, after the words proceeds and before the word shall, uh, I would like to add um, the words, except those funds needed to administer this ordinance. What it says is all alternative compliance carbon impact fee proceeds. And then I would add, except those funds needed to administer this ordinance shall be placed in a um, clean energy fund established, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it is possible that that should go at the end of the sentence or somewhere else if the, the placement there makes uh, is a little bit more confusing than it should be. Um, and the very last um, thought, just to finish that, regardless of where it's placed, I think you need an explicit allowance of the use of the fees. And I know that permitting and inspections are gonna need fees to administer this stuff. I perhaps even um, BET is gonna need some fees. And so um, we should minimize those, but know that we can't do it without administration. And finally, the last one would be to delete line one, uh, one 
91, which is a line that says to subsidize the cost of converting the city's vehicle fleet from fossil fuels to electric. And I mentioned this last week. Um, Jack says this policy is intended to accelerate building decarbonization. We need strong policy, stronger policies to decarbonize transportation, but those should not be at the direct expense of building decarbonization. Let's develop a stronger policy on transportation decarbonization that does not negatively impact building decarbonization. I would say that I just would like to, to see how this goes forward. I understand that the, this is when uh, remaining proceeds are uh, collected uh, and not paid uh, pursuant to um, helping uh, big buildings or um, you know technical assistance uh, and rebates um, above, but um, the, the the section before is to provide uh, financial assistance to help low income residents uh, deal with. Uh, the consequences of, uh, right, you know, of uh, funding these initiatives. And so um, I, I would like to, to test this before we turn around and uh, subsidize the, uh, the, the fleet. I think you said last time that, you know, you see this as a building um, related um, fee. And I think there's a lot of sense to it. I am open to the idea of using this for fleet uh, electrification, but not at the outs on the onset. And that completes the, what I think is actually a fairly short list of amendments for a six page dense ordinance. Councillor King, any immediate response? Um, I'm still trying to digest everything that Jean just said. Sure. Fair enough. As am I, but I will still bring in a little bit here where I have some notes. Okay, so um, just going in order, uh, I have Jack printed in yours and we made notes on both, which is a bad of me. I'll be able to follow my notes up there. So, um, so one thing that stood out for me in, in the recommendation on 935, first of all, I'll say that, like I said at the outset, my sort of general comments, this enumeration of, of renewables, um, although instructive, I don't know that based on the, um, our ability to levy a fee, are because that's on just on fossil fuels. They're they don't they store they're sort of instructive of the kinds of things that we would like to see, but um, but not necessarily things that we can do something about should people choose to use them. For instance, um, so so go so that's my sort of secondary general comment, but. On line 35, um, what stood out to me is I like I like the simplification idea for this whole section, but the word exclusively sort of jumps out at me because um, I think that that I mean, correct me if I'm wrong is is um, targeting the renewable gas correct? Uh, maybe not only, but yeah. Okay, and so I mean that's sort of I think open for discussion, I guess, and we don't need to do that. Yeah, I just want to sort of put a put a pin in that. And you know, and I'm not sure, actually, because of the because of the the, the, the safety valve. Because of the safety valve. Because of the safety valve. You know, so it, it sort of kicks it down the road, but it doesn't list it and identify it there. And I'm not sure that the safety valve is um is tight enough. But uh, this taxed my mental abilities as you know enough, so I couldn't quite get get there. Um, 
with that, you know, thinking this through um, and particular, yeah. So I'd like to put a pin in the, the word exclusively mm -hmm. in, in our discussion around this particular amendment um, on line 35 and perhaps explore that a little bit more. Um, so that's, I'll, I'll just say that for now. Um, and then deleting lines 52 to 65, um, like lines 52, green, green hydrogen, I'm not sure that we have authority to do anything with that. Green, hydro, green hydrogen either way, whether we include a reference to it in this list of definitions or not. So I'm just asking about utility of having it in here, as I am of advanced wood heating um, is a sustainably sourced biodiesel. Um, I, renewable gas is different to me, I think, because I do think if it's mixed with um, fossil fuel-based gas, which I believe is the intention, then there is maybe uh, an opportunity um, for us to do something that, although I won't say that I'm necessarily supportive of that, um, I would just say that I, I think that bullets four, five, and six are different than bullets seven. Um, and so it's my common, my running commentary on this. Um, and so I'm sort of, I'm a little agnostic about removing four, five, and six. And I think we need to see about the safety valve provision if we wanted to keep, um, and we may want to keep renewable gas in its current um, form uh, that, that's anticipated for delivery with fossil fuel gas. Um, in the, we want to make sure we, if we wanted to do that, we had the sufficient ability to do so. Um, and the safety valve, as you're calling it, number eight, right? Uh, yes, and, and number eight is is the safety valve. Um, so that's just like what I'm. Yeah. What 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 struck me about that? Yes. And I do think that um, this is where the implementation, well, the drafting of the uh, the regulation. So getting a draft regulation that defines the the, the carbon life cycle and, and does all of those other. Things that, that that law says is critically important right. to all of these that are you know four through seven. Um, and then uh, obviously the technical uh, fix on um, online seventy three. I'm supportive of that. <laughs> we we could pepper this. I was okay. What is next? Uh, the, uh, the, the, the and then the, you know in on line seventy three with the uh, the reference to the sections sure uh, the requirements of this section yeah yeah that's the one that yeah, yeah I, I, I yeah. agree with um and then we were on to lines one forty six to one fifty four and that question about that. was um so I, I followed what you were saying and i agree that we can't create a requirement and not have an administrative framework to ensure that it happens and so i like the idea of having it paid for anticipating having it paid for through the through the uh through the fee um but this this part i was not clear to me if the goal here um generally it is to make just to simplify this so there's a one-time certification at the beginning and not an annual certification is that what's and again like i was seeing this for the first time and i was trying to read it while and listen to you while you um were talking about it and maybe i would ask you I, 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 think, I think the answer is yes in terms of certification but um Leave it for Jack um, in terms of the uh, the rest of it. 
Um, I think it's also trying to make clear that we're talking about the actual fuel being delivered to the building. I think that's the other purpose of that change. I saw the big trackway um, advert the notice to that as well, which was kind of another thing I was going to ask about. Because I think it, it's the same question I had about ex is exclusively, right? Because it's, again, what other of the fuels that were enumerated, except for natural, renewable natural gas, were the supply? Can today? I speak to that? Yeah, because, uh, because I'm not trying to, with both of these, I'm not trying to prohibit the use of natural gas, but I'm trying to make clear that the avoidance of the fee is specific to not natural gas, that is specific to non-fossil fuels. And so if you're gonna be delivering a mix that's 90% you know, fossil fuel gas and 10% renewable gas, you would avoid the fee on the 10% not on the hundred, not on the full thing. And so this is why it's saying like, we wanna know what fuel is actually being delivered and, and how much of that fuel, so that we know how, how to assess the fee based on that, if they're using a mixture. Thank you for that clarification. That is helpful to me. Um, however, I wonder like if you install like, if you install a gas burning furnace in a home, and it's there for 20 years. And the, the menu of things you can buy from NGS changes over that 20 years. And you install it, and it was a 10%, let's say a 10% renewable, 90% fossil fuel-based mix. And you did some calculation based on that and came up with um, a D. And then like what when it if you bought then up buying something else from them somewhere during the light span of that um furnace then then you know and i don't think i don't know if this anticipates that the annual the annual certificate compliance certification would catch something like that i don't know if this amendment is it's if it isn't meant to be done annually or at some frequency then we wouldn't be able to um regulate that i mean i think that the 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 addition of the, the words for the life of that thermal energy system, when connected with the, the with the need to provide a contract that shows that there is that this is what's going to happen, contemplates that, and perhaps we need to uh, to make sure. As I as I speak, is sort of like the trust but verify uh, that you're not going to renegotiate a contract, you know? But if, if you change the appliance, then this is going, or the system, then this is gonna kick in for the new one. So you replace it, it gets old, you replace it. This is gonna continually be um, in place as long as you need to end. So this is all good conversation because, as long as you need to get a building permit. Very important. So, you know, protect perhaps uh, um, there are, um, but maybe maybe this is all that this is about. I have to uh, re look at that. So, so the first one is there. And you're also then just providing that, that estimate there. This change um, does not include and i think it's a good question as to whether there's any periodic um recertifications but i would note that the proposed like that the, the language in the referred ordinance that we got uh the first red ordinance only applies uh the um the certification if a person chooses that contract so you still have the problem um for those where you you've got a contract that demonstrates that the fuel requiring uh required is fully sourced right for the life so um it, it does not contemplate 
an annual certification as is currently and un uh, unamended written that might be right. i'll say there was a gap i don't know so a contract might be just an agreement to purchase fuel from um like in this case i've been talking about gas we're not from on gas yes and so you could a year or two would be having this new appliance side that you want to purchase something else they have a different product that they could sell you um, which would have a potentially different mix. Well, the contract would have to be for the life of that energy system, but it does not, um, on either language, um, right. ad address that renegotiation of a contract and the replacement of it. And I think that that is a good That's yeah, why we need administrative fees. So people can well, the annual so, compliance recertification, I guess, but. I guess if you had a change, it wouldn't trigger the right. entire pro rata share. It might just, if there was, you were going to, you know. And um, again, the right now, it is, as it is written, the annual compliance certification doesn't apply if you're showing a contract that demonstrates that it's fully going to be fully sourced. Um, and my next my next question so thank you and so i think that's one i want to think a little bit more about um the but i like the idea of trying to simplify what's in what's there but you know without losing the intent of it um and with regard to trying to um sort of uh Use out what might be renewable in a mix. Um, I want to think about that as well. So, um, the next question I had, I'm hoping um, Aaron can help us with, or maybe maybe you can. Um, why why do we have um, Section E? This is the one uh, lines 156 to 160, which I think was one of your deletes. Yeah. Why is that there? What's the the intent of that is to give some credit. Well, I'll let you just talk about Would it be okay if I jump backwards for half a second? Absolutely. Just to go to the previous conversation. Absolutely. So I don't think the contemplation was that there would be a mix of fossil and renewable fuel eligible here. So I actually don't have any concern with the language exclusively because that is the intent exclusively. However, um, I do have concern if we're taking items off the list because I think we 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 know those items are going to be eligible regardless, so it'd be helpful to have the fully enumerated list. Uh, having the words exclusively, agree with 100%. The issue there, which kind of goes to the section you were just discussing, is with fuels like renewable natural gas, we don't track the molecule. There, there's, we're not thinking about what's delivered to the building. That's not a way we can actually certify anything. And nobody has a lifetime contract for renewable gas. If you had to, if you wanted to simplify, I would argue in favor of simplifying by having only annual certification as opposed to a lifetime contract. And it would ensure that every year we're checking that the person who signed up is getting that renewable fuel. I think it solves the issue. Uh, it's also the practical reality. You, you can't purchase a 20 year contract uh, with VGS uh, for this or with a fuel dealer for biodiesel. Um, so having annual, I would strongly urge we keep annual and get rid of lifetime if we want to. Um, as, as a way to simplify, but delivered to the building is the challenge because we track uh, renewable gas through buying the attribute and putting uh, the premium on the customer to say, I'm paying more uh, on my fuel bill and I'm willing to have Vermont Gas go out and purchase a certain quantity for me. And they're gonna put it in their system, but I can't track the molecule that's being delivered to my home. And so, you know, part of what we presented to voters, part of the presentation that we made to stakeholders was the idea that this would be an eligible option because we know there are buildings where they won't be able to electrify and where absent this option, they may simply be, we said, fee not tax earlier, it'll become a tax uh, because they won't have an option. And so uh, I'm spe you know, specifically thinking about existing buildings. Um, so I, I would urge some caution on that piece of it um, relative to uh, retaining eligibility in the way that we track it with all resources, the way we track community solar, 
we do it with renewable credits, not with the electrons that are being delivered. Should be the same thing uh, here to be consistent. To answer your question, you actually asked me though, uh, as opposed to the other piece. Uh, this is also an important provision that we talked about with stakeholders. We're not, I think Jack mentioned this earlier, this ordinance does not create a full comprehensive regulation of thermal energy, and particularly with existing buildings. We're really only touching 80 buildings, but we know that many of those building uh, owners have a suite of facilities. And the idea here is to encourage early action where it's not required and to have them purchase renewable fuels or install renewable systems ahead of any other requirement to do so and to get credit for that against any potential uh, future obligation that they would have. Um, it was an idea that was presented by stakeholders in the stakeholder process. It makes sense to me only in the context that we're not fully regulating here. Uh, to use the incentive analogy, uh, with the incentives, we are sort of uh, fully covering the field. Um, we are providing an incentive uh, and we know that, you know, we're not going to give someone credit for something they already did, but we're offering incentives for things we want them to do. Here, we're not fully covering the field. We're really only covering a really small portion of existing buildings. And if somebody has 20 buildings and only one is covered, I want them to have the incentive to do things beyond what's required. And so this was an idea that came through the stakeholder sessions that we're very supportive of for that reason. So this is not new construction. This is beyond and contemplated to be beyond new construction and existing large buildings and um, and city buildings. The ones that are this is like right. in a way your a rebate system for those folks who yeah. have. More buildings, right? Multiple buildings, encouraging early action where it wouldn't otherwise be required. Thank you, sir. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I think that that is uh, something for us to be uh, for us to be thinking about um, as as we go through. I, I, I think that the uh, the the accounting. Of renewable gas, and I expressed my my thoughts to Dylan um, when we had our conversations. I mean, they're going to be putting those systems into the state system, and they're going to come up with whatever credits the state comes up with. It the state's going to analyze them and, and do that whole thing. And from a then then they've got this. They've got a big system. Their accounting is really system-wide as opposed to customer-wide, whereas this is related to uh, to customers. Um, I think that's it, it really is a, a good reason for us to see how that um, state system scores things and how that works out before we start adding this, uh, this list. So that's my just sort of you know, since with that, it, it you know, it may be that uh, the scoring will, there'll be consensus. Uh, people will see that um, it's it's absolutely right and we can all get behind it. But um, that is the reason to, to go to that list um, in 52 through uh, 65 and um, and just remove them. From, from that um, as, as if they are already decided to be um, that, that they they we've already decided that they have they are reducing greenhouse gas emissions sort of like uh, I hate rock cream but uh, I want to verify oh, uh, go ahead. I apologize I don't want to speak this is the form but I know members of the public have been allowed to could I just offer sure. a little context as well um, relative to the statewide for PDAC context I would note that within the draft ordinance, starting on line 37, you enumerate multiple technologies beyond just those within 52 to 65 when you propose some changes to. And amongst those, for instance, on 37, uh, several of these would fall into the life cycle analysis that the Affordable Heat Act will do. They include cold climate, air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, other heat pumps, including district, network, grid, micro grid, grid, and building geothermal systems, um, and then additionally, you pump water heaters. Uh, so I would just point out that all of these technologies on this list that are contemplated as being exempt from the fee 
are measures that will be uh, assessed on a life cycle analysis. And I mentioned earlier that importance of an apples to apples comparison. When we look to the science, we should be sure of where the greenhouse gas uh, reduction is being made. That statewide context will do it. And here, you've sort of honored that intent by listing these as eligible measures uh, based upon their renewable content. So it's just a piece of information I wanted to share. So it's, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions about particular energy sources in that 52 to 65 section, uh, but I'll just leave it there for now. Just know that the Affordable Heat Act context and statewide policymaking will be assessing all of these measures. Uh, and it would include things like the electric mix and other characteristics that sort of been touched on. Thank you. Shall I move on? Sure, so Nick would like oh, yeah, I'd, I'd like a chance to. I, I actually have a proposed amendment that I think everyone would love. Um, it's, I, I just think this was an oversight. Paragraph one, uh, line 175. If it's half of the proceeds paid into the clean energy fund by a large existing building applicant, shall be available to the payor for projects to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at any site owned by the payor. Don't we want to limit that to sites owned by the payor located in the city of Burlington? I mean, we talked before about wanting to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and fertilizer. And while you're thinking about that, I just had a couple of other comments. Um, I'm concerned about adding the language to paragraph 35, exclusively renewable non-fossil fuel sources, such as, I don't think you need it. I don't think it adds anything. I think you might be stubbing yourselves in the foot if you add it because, I mean, we want um, electric heat pumps that are powered by the grid to be included. And they're not non fossil fuel sources because the grid contains some fossil fuel power. I, I mean, I think that's a possible unintended consequence of that language. You know, we're drawing from the New England grid and it's got gas plants, you know, providing power to us. And um, I approve of the deletion of four through seven. I'm concerned about the catch all in paragraph eight. Because I just don't, I'm concerned that the Department of Permitting and Inspections doesn't have the expertise to determine whether a particular technology is going to reduce greenhouse gases relative to the fossil fuels replacing. I think it's a bad idea to have that catch all. I think we should limit what's acceptable to discrete. Um, types of power, and then when the state finishes its process with, with S5, if you think it's appropriate, then you can add to the list. So those are my comments. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to time keep for us here. It's 6 50. We have 10 minutes to wrap this up and be on our way out of here. Let me throw that by a chocolate printer. So um, I will. Uh, just continue on. I had one more comment on the proposed amendments, and it was on. Uh, it was on. Oh no, two more. I I uh, I approve of your suggestion on line one sixty three to put language in that sort of anticipates how we'll fund the administration of this and using using the impact fee. So I think that that's a good that's a good change for us to to introduce. Um, on line one ninety one, it's one that I was stuck on early in our deliberation on this. Um, 
on this ordinance. And, you know, my preference would be to, if this were, were, were raising this fee on the thermal sector, it should be used to address the thermal sector. However, um, you know, I also understand sort of the fiscal position of the city and needing to have as many tools in the toolbox we have in our constrained capital environment. So I'm open to sort of being broad enough to allow it, but also I think I agree with Eugene that we should really use it as a tool of last resort because we really we need, you know, this year, I think we, we replaced seven vehicles in the entire fleet, um, where in a normal year, we were, you know, we're up in the high teens or low 20s. Um, and so that's going to start to add up over time. And we're going to have to figure something out while we're paying for our high school. So this is just a reality um, of where we are and how the levers we need to, to pull. And, you know, obviously, um, that's why this is in here. So I'm open to it. I don't love it. Um, and I've made that known. And I'd rather see the money spent weatherizing buildings and uh, getting uh, other systems in place for folks who might not be able to otherwise afford them that meet our climate goals. But um, so, so one, one alternative is to, instead of having this be a second alternative to the lie, three little lies, is that you have it be a fourth section. And if there are no low-income Burlingtonian residents, and there are no uh, large existing building applicants, and there are no other um, folks that um, are eligible for weatherization um, or increased utility costs that are found in the, the sections above, and there's still money left over, then maybe then you then you can you know electrify the fleet. But you know you're basically because it, because I can tell you right, we'll look at this and we'll we will take money out of this to fund the electrification of the fleet at the expense of low income folks. I, I dollars to donuts. We will figure out a way to shrink that amount because we've got multiple constituents and I don't want to do that. Everybody who is in the list above, um, I think should uh, be able to benefit from these monies. And if there's any money left over, well, that's a very good um, and public use of the funds. But um, so that, that, that is one off the top way that we could probably, you know, be too clever by house. Um, so those are those are my comments. Um, Anna, do you have anything you'd like to weigh in with? Um, the only thing that I would agree with right now is amending um, line one sixty three with Gene's amendment. I feel good about that too. That's the fee. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's as far as we can get tonight. And uh, so for next steps, um, I had message the uh then drivers the chair of the ordinance committee and he said they'll get to it when we're done with it. Um, so they don't have it scheduled right now um and so uh, i think uh i think that i still want to sort of take in some of what was um offered and learn a little more and think about it and I don't know, maybe you do as well. I know Hannah said uh, she did. So, um, so given that, um, we would be able to maybe take some time out of our regular schedule. I, I think it's dangerous I, because we always have, have a lot. We do. We have a lot of stuff. We do. I would think that us meeting on the 15th, which is in two weeks, I have a so message what I could get to <laughs> to suggest that um, with our meeting on the 22nd already there for normal things, DPW always loves us to, to take up stuff. Uh, on the 15th? On the 15th. Okay. 
forward for you. And it's a Tuesday. Yeah, I'm checking right now. I think it should, yeah. So I could I can meet that day. And so we would then at that point maybe review. And this is the process piece we should probably decide on in the next four minutes. Um, see if there's something we can all recommend. And if we all can recommend something, we can offer those things that we discussed along with any commentary by individual counselors on what they support and don't support. Does that seem like somebody we offer that to the ordinance committee? Sure. I mean, I, I think that if two of us were to feel good about something, then we should be able to, you know, to let them know that. But right. but I think that they should get, you know, they should, they should get a full they should understanding get of yeah yeah. And every every voice, every every committee voice should be part of it, and all the community voices are part of the public record. They should get it. If we're going to plug them. And it's not, I mean, I know personally, I, I plan to with, attend those meetings when they deliberate on that. Um, so we had all the conflict. So um, we can continue the discussion in ordinance as well. Yeah. Um, as I'm sure members of the public and uh, other stakeholders will. Yep. And it would be really helpful to get staff comments on, on these uh, proposed amendments as well. Because you know, if we have two weeks, then we get a chance to you know to to mull, and we've got alternatives and or you know, comments and you know, there there are proposed tweaks or changes. That, I mean, I think uh, this has been a good process for that. I want to continue that? So, <laughs> is the meeting on the fifteenth at the same time? Uh, yeah, so it would be at five o'clock if we can get around somewhere. This room is not available, and DPW uh, six forty five is not available. Could we could we be at DPD? We'll check. Okay, momentarily. Yeah, we were going to go there last time, and we ended up there. So as long as they have a magic screen, a uh, way to we do keep technologically project us into the world. I can ask, how can the public participate? Will you post the proposed amendment? Uh, I believe we're going to post uh, what uh, Gene discussed, which was a variation or an addition to what Jack had emailed the committee. On. All of that's going to be part of tonight's meeting. Order. So you could see that. And if you had additional things, I know you've already submitted things. Um, via email, and we've included them in the record. Okay. We would continue okay. that process. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And any particular language, it would be great, I think, for us to get proposed amendments and to get it in sort of its own document that says this is a proposed agenda amendment for for this ordinance, and that's not buried. Rather than mark it up some of those drafts. You know, and it's something that makes it clear Thanks. to us. What they are, and you know that really focuses on the um, on the amendment, so that it's easy for us to sure. identify it, as opposed to the whole. You know, you're giving us six pages, but that only that one line that you were talking about is what's right. Right. So I got you. They do that, like the legislature will, uh, in, in the way that they mark up things, that uh, they just like identify the amendments. Okay. I'll have to check and get back to you. If that's okay. That's yeah. fine. If, and if we can't do it, maybe we'll find a place okay. to do it. Yeah. It just took my invitation. So, right. Oh, it did. Tentative for yeah, so Tentatively, we'll be at what's the address? Um, 585. 585 Pine at 5 o'clock on the 15th to continue this conversation. Oh, it was declined. I'm sorry. Was was I put it in and then it declined me. We'll, we'll all check on it. We will find we will find a meeting place. We can try Fletcher Free Library. We could do that if we needed to. I don't know. Do they have like a they have screens? Yeah. yeah. Everybody does. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Uh, without any further business, I will adjourn us. It's 701. Perfect.